Welcome to the EHJ Today at the Cardiology Update in Davos. My name is Robert Manka. I work for the University Hospital in Zurich and I'm expert in imaging. Joining me is Jerome Bex from Leiden, professor of uh, cardiology and the current president of the ESC. Today we will discuss uh, the role of imaging in transcatheter uh, valvular replacement. Jerome, my first question, uh, what kind of valves uh, we have to examine prior to uh, this intervention? I think if you look at the recent times, it started actually with the transcatheter aortic valves uh, replacement. And uh, that has taken such a big spin that nowadays I don't know how many valves are being replaced with the transcatheter approach but we've witnessed a tremendous development. It started with the patients that were non-operable, um, but still could be treated by a transcatheter heart valve, and it was shown that this outcome was better than, of course, if you didn't treat them at all. And it was also shown that in the ones that were still operable, but severely compromised with a high uh, SDS or Euro score, that these patients actually had a similar outcome in terms of surgery as compared to transcatheter heart valve. So then we move to lower risk categories as has been shown recently and the outcome is very good. So we have reduced intensive care time, complications is reduced. So this, there is a lot of interest in this uh, transcatheter aortic valve replacement. And from that, the next stops have already started to come. So the next stop is the mitral valve, okay. where we look actually at uh, mitral clips, which make possible that you clip the leaflets. So this is not replacing the valve. This is uh, symptomatic at the moment, mostly treatment. So that is something that uh, achieves a lot of attention. There's a lot of data actually already on the uh, uh, mitral clips. And it shows clearly that these patients do better in terms of New York class than if you don't treat them. Um, there is also already development in transcatheter mitral valve replacement. And there are other opportunities of repairing. So you could combine, for example, cardio band, where you combine the uh, mitral clip with the cardio bands. That's a possibility. And now the next step is going to be, of course, the, uh, the tricuspid valve, because we have realized that a lot of patients with severe mitral regurgitation at the end of the day uh, develop tricuspid regurgitation because the left ventricle starts to dilate more pressure on the left atrium and then the right ventricle also suffers and starts to dilate resulting in tricuspid regurgitation so if you ask me what valves i think first aortics that's where it all started that is now not completed there's still a lot to do but um, we see that there's now a shift towards mitrals and that there's a very rapid shift toward tricuspid and also mitrals. Transcatheter replacement is going to be quite difficult because the mitral valve is not so simple as the aortic valve or the tricuspid valve. So thank you, it's very interesting. Um, we have a bright future in replacement valve of, with catheters, but um, we have to assess those patients before we start uh, all those interventions and they are very complex. So which uh, imaging modality would you use or are used to assess all those valves in those patients? Yeah, it depends of course a little bit of the valve that we're talking about and it depends also of the disease of that specific valve. But in general, we have four imaging modalities. So we have nuclear imaging, we have CT imaging, we have magnetic resonance imaging and we have echocardiography. The mainstay in valve disease has always been echocardiography. We started with two-dimensional echocardiography, then to transesophageal, and now we are three-dimensional echocardiography, and also doing that transesophageal. So that gives very nice assessment of um, the valvular function. Echo, I would say, is a good anatomic imager, but it's probably even better in functional imaging. What does it mean, functional imaging? Assessment of the lesion. Why is this valve leaking? But more importantly, how much is the valve leaking? What is the regurgitant volume? What is the regurgitant orifice? So this works for the mitral, for the aortic, for all of the valves. So functional imaging, you do a lot with echocardiography. I think nuclear imaging, the assessment of valves before uh, transcatheter imaging does not play a major role. Um, I think MRI, there is some role, but not that much has been described yet. 
MRI has the potential to combine anatomic imaging, good anatomic imaging with high resolution, combine it with functional imaging, mm -hmm. but uh, these patients are often sick uh, and in the magnet it's difficult for these patients to stay that long time. Um, but ideally, um, magnetic resonance imaging is the technique that could give pure quantification of the regurgitant volume, let's say, of mitral regurgitation. Um, and then, of course, we have CT. Now, CT is going to be the natural imager in terms of anatomic imaging. We can assess precisely all the anatomy of the valve. And when we speak about transcatheter heart valves, we see that we need a combination of functional imaging and anatomical imaging. I think that goes basically for every disease. If you look at an oncological tumor, you want to know the size and the location, but you also want to know the activity. So you combine in that case probably PET-CT, where you see with CT the size, and with PET you see the activity of the tumor. Now the same is true for valvular heart disease. We need to know all the anatomical information, and at the same time we need to have the functional consequences of that. So integration of function and uh, anatomy is going to be key. So if you ask me which technique, I would say the major techniques that are being used is CT and echocardiography. Echocardiography mostly three-dimensional. Okay, that's um, very interesting. Uh, so let's take an example. We have a patient about 80 years old, has a severe aortic stenosis, is a candidate for a uh, TAVI procedure. So how would you assess this patient and what are the key points uh, we have to measure and assess uh, before doing this uh, intervention? So actually what you're talking about is a checklist. You yes. need a pre-procedural checklist. And so this will certainly come back in the new heart valve guideline that's going to come out in 2017 right at the moment of ESC in Barcelona. I would say if we speak about aortic disease, you want to know certain things. First of all, you need to think about access sites. Most of these patients are being accessed uh, through the peripheral arteries. So you need a CT scan or an angiogram. Usually we do a CT scan because that covers everything that we're going to speak about. We do a CT scan and we look at the diameter, the tortuosity, and the calcifications of the peripheral vasculature because that dictates if we can enter with a catheter or not, and also what catheter size is going to fit in this vessel. Then if we go upwards, we need to image the aorta. We need to see if there are calcifications. If you're dealing with a porcelain aorta, then the risk of embolization to the brain is high. So probably you need to think about a different approach. If you then continue further, you enter the aortic root. The first thing you encounter is the coronary arteries. So you need to know the distance of the coronary arteries to the annular plane of the aortic valve. If that distance is too short, then you have a light, uh, likelihood, high likelihood, that this valve is going to partially obstruct that coronary artery with all the problems that can occur afterwards. So that is important, distance of the coronary arteries. The next step is then you want to know the different uh, dimensions of the um, sinotubular junction, the sinuses, the coronary sinuses, and most importantly, the annulus, because that's where your valve is going to fit. So you need to have information about, first of all, is it an oval shaped, is it very oval shaped, and what is the size? And that's important for sizing of this valve. Well, then if you move on, you enter the ventricle. You want to also have certain information about the ventricle because if there's a severe sigmoid septum, what we see often in elderly patients, we're talking about elderly patients, um, with severe aortic stenosis, you see the unrolling of the aorta, and that comes with a sigmoid septum. Sigmoid septum is, of course, potentially obstructing, so you need to think that, take that into account. Then some of the patients will not have a... a a trans uh, aortic approach, uh, trans, uh, trans uh, peripheral vascular approach, but they will have an approach through the uh, apex of the ventricle. So you want to take a look at the ventricle. Are there no thrombi there? No other uh, problems in the ventricle? And then if you think about a subclavian approach, you also need to image the subclavian arteries. And then finally, if you want to do a direct aortic approach, that asks again for more information on the course and the location of the aorta. So you have a whole lot of information that you want to have 
before you start with the procedure. As I said, most of it comes from CT, mm -hmm. but substantial amount of information also comes from echocardiography. Okay, that's great. So for the aorta, we have a checklist at the moment. Are there any checklists for the mitral valve and the tricuspid valve now? Are for the mitral valve, it's coming a little bit. Mm -hmm. We also have for the aortic is a relatively simple uh, valve. The mitral, there are lots of different procedures, so that's going to ask for a lot of different imaging, and that is certainly not crystal clear yet. It becomes more and more clear that for our transcatheter mitral, we need also echo, very good echo, but also CT, which we are not used to when we were referring for surgery, we just did echocardiography. And for the transcatheter tricuspid, we probably need even more CT because the right coronary artery that courses quite in close proximity of the um, tricuspid annulus and if the valve dilates there becomes less distance so if you're going to do procedures there you need to think about where is that right coronary coursing as compared to where I'm going to do my procedures there is no checklist for tricuspids yet it also depends, and that's the same for the, for the mitral, there are different devices, and the different devices dictate different informations. Mm -hmm. Aortic, relatively simple, standardized checklist, mostly CT, some part echocardiography, mitrals and tricuspid, depending on the device that you're considering. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Jerome, for this uh, very nice interview, giving us an overview of uh, imaging in, in these uh, different valves we have now uh, available for transcatheter uh, replacement. Is there maybe short uh, take-home message for, for our audience? I think one needs to be very alerted because the field is changing all the time. So you need to keep up with it. You need to understand very well uh, valvular anatomy, ventricular anatomy, the things related to this valve disease. Anatomy and function is very important. So do not think one technique fits all. You need to have different techniques. Echo and CT is going to be good marriage. And most of all, what is important is that you think about the sort of techniques you're going to use and then match your information to what is needed for that technique. So thank you very much for this um, great interview. Uh, we now will finish and uh, we'll come up to, to, to the end. Thank you very much. This was very good. Thank you. It was my pleasure.